back to the show. Last episode, I left us on a sad note, and this episode, you want to get ready for some infighting, some great ballet, and a little bit of a summary of what was happening on Broadway while all of this was going on. By the time this episode actually comes out, I will have just finished the first weekend of shows for Much Ado About Nothing. Whoop, whoop. I'm actually recording this right before I go to our preview. Don't worry though, we still have five more shows in three really cool locations. There's a link in the description and in the show notes of where to get tickets and where our three locations are. Now on to this show. After the death of Sir Diaghilev, the company scattered. Dancers and choreographers couldn't and still can't afford to just stop. Massine was working in New York as a soloist and ballet master at S.L. Rothefeld's Roxy Theatre. If you thought that would get him away from the European company, you'd be wrong. Famous lyricist and composer Cole Porter, he'd go on to write Anything Goes, and empresario E. Ray Gutierrez were also in New York. And they encouraged him to take over the company. Gutierrez would even manage to get a hold of the original Diaghilev sets and costumes, which would be worn for a stupidly long amount of time. Massine was interested, but if you know what followed 1929, i.e. 1930 and the Great Depression, that plan was slowed a little. On Broadway, that year there were a number of successes, which, while they weren't well-known shows, they had well-known creative teams. These include Sweet Adeline with Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein II, Bittersweet by Noel Coward, Showgirl with music and lyrics by George and Irish Gershwin, and produced by Florence Zegfeld, Shotgun Wedding by Richard Rogers and Lawrence Hart, which had a book more solid than the usual conventional plot of a musical comedy. So, you know, good on them. There are also two Cole Porter shows, Wake Up and Dream and Fifty Million Frenchmen. Despite the company not actually being taken over, by 1930 there were rumours that Messine was going to take over the Ballet Russe. The New York dance critic John Martin wrote to him and asked if he was planning on creating a company to reproduce the great success of Diaghilev with American dancers. There was a company producing ballets similar to the Diaghilev rep, though not with American dancers. It was the Monte Carlo Opera Ballet. They alternated nights of operas featuring ballets and all ballet programs. Bronislava Nojinska worked as a stager and choreographer for both the ballets and the operas, with a mixture of folkine rap and her own work. Alexandra Danilova, or Danilova, I've also heard it pronounced, I guess I'm going to say it Danilova from now on, because I heard someone who knows things say it that way. Alexandra Danilova danced with this company. On Broadway, George Gershwin's Strike Up the Band opens, and in the West End, George Balanchine choreographed ballets for Cochrane Review. Good year for George's. 1931 began with a tragedy. Prima ballerina absoluta, Anna Pavlova, died at the age of 49 from pneumonia and pleurisy, an inflammation of the membranes around the lungs. The next day, as was the ballet tradition, the show went on, and instead of making her entrance, the spotlight simply lit up her place on the stage. On Broadway, there was Jerome Kern and Otto Harbach's The Cat and the Fiddle, which was a more blended operetta, and Gershwin's Of The I Sing debuted. It won a Pulitzer Prize, so not bad. Former ballet russe dancers Alexandra Danilova and Tamara Karsavina both spent this year in London. The former performed in a musical called Waltzes in Vienna, in London, and the latter began working as the director of the Royal Academy of Dance. This time, we are talking about the RAD who does all the exams. At Casino de Monte Carlo, you know, in Monte Carlo, René Blum is the ballet guy. He pulls together dancers and choreographers and the like to have ballets performed. Monaco managed to avoid the worst of the Great Depression in the way only a tiny country can. We avoided it by building the Harbour Bridge. I just think that's cool. The company included in it Filia Dubrovska, Anatole Obakov, and Boris Romanov. Not the same Romanovs. He was the ballet master. These names might not be familiar to you just yet, but we'll hear a little bit more about them next episode. Ooh, foreshadow, foreshadow. No, it's just what happens when you have a, a, a story that progresses from one thing to another. 
Messine approached Blum to discuss the possibility of putting together a new ballet russe. René Blum replied in a letter, The more I think about it, the more I recognise the unseemliness of an organisation that would be nothing more than an extension of the former Diaghilev ballet without Diaghilev himself. That is to say, without the prestige of the wonderful man who created it, and who was able to keep it going for 50 years in Monte Carlo in the face of all adversity. Besides, I have explored the possibilities, and I have put the question to some people in Monaco. Their response has been the same. Give us something else. Messine didn't stop working in ballet. He presented his ballet, Amphion, for example, at the Paris Opera Ballet. Nijinsky's sister, Brunslava Nijinska, joined the Opera Russe à Paris, another attempt at a ballet company. 1932 saw two important productions on Broadway. I mean, of course, there were more than two. There's always going to be more than two, but I can't talk about everything. These were Music in the Air by Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammerstein II and George White's Scandals, an annual Follies style review, this time starring Ethel Merman. I just want to say, if these names in the Broadway interludes aren't familiar, don't worry. The concurrent Broadway shows are mostly to give you some context, and especially towards the end, the story gets pretty sad without them. If you don't know what an Ethel Merman is, or why is a Follies, don't, don't worry. It really won't impact the story. The same year saw the proper founding of the new Ballet Russe. George Balanchine, who was brought on as Ballet Master, didn't want to put Russe in the name. So it was originally going to be called Ballet de Monte Carlo. That didn't actually last. The company had a lot of names, so I'm usually just going to refer to it by the director. The longest of the names was La Société de Ballet de Monte Carlo et Ballet de Monte Carlo. I don't use people's insanely long Russian names, and I'm not going to say that every time I want to talk about the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, so that's what I'll call it. Or The Blum Company. If I'm talking about the older company, I'll say Diaghilev Ballet Russe. The company separated from and took over some of the historic producing responsibilities of the Opera Russe. They took all the ballet costumes and sets, and the old company signed a contract agreeing not to produce any ballets or to interfere with the new company. It would suck to sign that and then they, I don't know, burn down your set. I don't know what they'd do. Something evil. A good number of the Diaghilev crew rejoined. Sir Griogev, a different Serg, continued as the Register General. Balanchine was the ballet master and main choreographer, basically the on-call guy. Massine was invited as another choreographer and de Basil had a more producery role. René Blum didn't actually have a formal administrative role. Franslava Nijinska was also invited to join with a pretty generous contract, but she decided that she wanted to start her own company. One of the famous features of this company was the baby ballerinas, Tamara Tomunova, Tatiana Ryabuchinska, skuska, skuska, Tatiana Ryabuchinska, and Irina Baranova. Only one of these is going to get any real focus in this episode because I can't talk about a company with 80 dancers in it and talk about everyone individually. Whereas in Diaghilev's company, the baby was 17-year-old Lydia Lobakova, these dancers were all in their early teens. On April 12th, the new company performed its first season under the patronage of the Princess of Monte Carlo. This season includes four new ballets, Cotillion, Le Concurrence and Le Bourgeois Gentilhomme by George Balanchine and Jeux d'Enfant by Leonard Massine. The season was a huge success. Almost. It was a commercially successful season, but I have a question for you. What happens when you put a bunch of ambitious, talented, and somewhat narcissistic people in a room together? Or in a team together? All throughout the process, Balanchine and de Basil were in disagreement. Balanchine didn't like that de Basil took bribes from dancers wanting better roles. Marrying them is apparently chill, though. We'll get to that. Balanchine was looking to leave, secretly taking dancers to form his own company, and de Basil just straight up fired him. In January 1933, Balanchine founded his own company, Le Ballet, a super-duper creative name. 
14-year-old Tamara Tumanova came with him to his new company. 14. If this wasn't an audio thing, I'd want to put a photo of me at 14 there to just show the absurdity of that. Oof. The Monte Carlo crew would respond to this by suing Balanchine and Tomanova, with a case coming to trial in June where it was dismissed. This tour was popular with the Bloomsbury set. We talked a little about them last episode with Lydia Lopakova and John Maynard Keynes. Outside of that group, not super popular. It was a one-year company. Back to the more successful company. <laughs> what a mean transition. Welcome to my podcast, me dunking on history. 1933 was a big year. They might have lost to a Minerva, but they gained Alexandra Danilova. They started out, as usual, in Monte Carlo, and then they had their first trip to Barcelona. Massin stepped into Balanchine's role. They also had two British impresarios propose London seasons, one at the Lyceum and one at the Colosseum. Their actual London season, though, was at the Alhambra. Agnes DeMille, the Oklahoma choreographer-to-be, saw this London season, and her review was pretty positive. Going to the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo was the thing to do. There was one new David Lychin ballet this season, Nocturne, and a couple of Massine ones. Le Passage, Le Bout d'Anable, Beach, Scola di Ballo, Corantium, and Union Pacific. On Broadway, Jerome Kern and Otto Harbach had Roberta. The show wasn't a huge success until one of its songs, Smoke Gets In Your Eyes, got on the radio. And then it was the place to be. There was also Gershwin's Let Them Eat Cake, the not at all successful sequel to the super successful of the icing. 1934 saw the beginning of the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo US tour. Sol Hurok, the manager of the late Anna Pavlova organised the tour. It was a massive risk to take this ginormous company to a country that didn't really have an established ballet audience during the Great Depression. It was a risk that totally paid off. Also in the US that year was Cole Porter's Anything Goes, starring Ethel Merman. It's pretty widely reported that she was a consummate professional slash perfectionist. It's a double-edged sword. She'd be on time and know her lines, but if you stepped on her line, she would get you fired. Interestingly, the whole production only cost about $2,000. Balanchine was not the only one to defect from the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo. This is a little bit complicated, so you'll have to bear with me. The company had two annual contracts at this point. Sol Hurek's four-month US tour, and the six weeks at the casino in Monte Carlo financially supported by La Société de Bain, which was the connection that Blum brought. This year, the London season was at the very prestigious Covent Garden alongside their London Philharmonic, and there was also a Paris season. Because of scheduling issues, the initial season that Casino in Monte Carlo won had to be contracted out. Nijinska's company performed those six weeks, supplemented with a couple of Ballet Russe dancers, including Alexandra Danilova. So what was the problem? The London and Paris seasons. Specifically, the billing. Rather than billing it as the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, as was stipulated by the contracts, they billed the company as the Ballet Russe de Colonel W. de Basel. And by they, I mean not Blum. There were really specific rules about billing shows. I mean, there still are. If you ever notice that the names at the top of a DVD or a film poster don't match up with where the actors are standing on the poster, that's because of billing. There are specific rules and procedures about who gets credited where, in what size, in what order, and if you get special introductions. For Blum, this was a bit of a dig, especially given that the Monte Carlo part was his part. The society already didn't like that Blum wasn't in the sort of administrative position that de Basel was, and the billings were just the final straw. Blum left to form his own company. It wasn't all bad. The repertoire expanded to include revivals of petit pas work, rather than just the post-petit pas choreography of the Diaghilev Ballet Russe. Baby ballerina Tormanova trained in flamenco for her debut in the Massine Ballet Le Tricone. 
Alongside that, the season also included Les Imaginaires by David Lichin and Jardin Public by Leonide Messine. On Broadway in 1934, Alexandra Danilova danced in the chorus of Song of Norway. The next year, Balanchine presented a series of ballets on Broadway, including the ever-popular Serenade. This ballet is a favourite of friend of the podcast, a thing I can now say, Lyrica Woodruff, who actually danced one of the roles in her SAB workshop. We'll talk more about Balanchine later. This is also the year he founded the School of American Ballet, but again, next time. The Land of the Bells had in its ensemble Nora Kay, who's going to turn out to be a real crossover performer. Also on Broadway was the Rogers and Hart circus show Jumbo, directed by George Abbott, who we met last season, as well as Porgy and Bess by George Gershwin. The London season was expanded to three months, which definitely lessened the hurt of losing six weeks in Monte Carlo. In addition to their own shows, they also performed with the Royal Opera, including in Prince Igor. The only new ballet of the season was Le Saint-Bézier by Bronislava Nijinsky. It was a tragic year for her, though. Her entire family was in a car accident, and while her and her husband were unharmed, their daughter was severely injured and their son died. The US tour wasn't all bad, though. The Metropolitan Opera House had just been built, giving the Ballet Russe a proper theatre in Manhattan, on par with the famous theatres in Europe. The audience for this season was also broader than before, with more people attending and more types of people. I should also say, I don't mean that like dog whistly, I just mean like not just normal gala audiences. <laughs> I realised that that sounded weird as soon as it came out of my mouth. The rest of the tour was pretty brutal though. In smaller cities, they only performed for a single night. They would perform three ballets in one city, one act, not full lengths, with sets and costumes for the next three sent ahead to the next theatre. The pace of this tour likely contributed to the short careers and early retirements of many of the dancers. 1936 was a big year on Broadway for dance. Balanchine choreographed ballets for the Ziegfeld Follies of 1936, as well as Slaughter on 10th Avenue for Rogers and Hart's On Your Toes. A quote from Gamze de Lape illustrates the situation for ballet in New York. At that time, there were lots of good dancers in American Ballet Theatre and the Ballet Russe, but they didn't have full contracts. They didn't work for a full year, so they had time available. They went between Broadway and serious ballet or modern dance, and you had this big pool of really good available dancers. Everyone was doing it. Nora Kay, Alyssa Alonso, Johnny Kreiser. Agnes DeMille, but now back from her London training, choreographed dances for a production of Hamlet. The next year, Broadway had more dance. Rogers and Hart wrote Babes in Arms, which George Balanchine choreographed. Nora Kay danced in the core of Virginia. Brothers and writing team George and Ira Gershwin went to Hollywood to write scores for two new films, Shall We Dance and A Damsel in Distress, both Fred Astaire pictures, with the former also featuring Ginger Rogers. The de Basel season began this year in Barcelona which was in the middle of political turmoil. There was difficulty leaving because taxis weren't running, and travelling in a large group was unsafe. The dancers would whistle a motif from Scheherazade if they got lost so other dancers could find them. In the London season, de Basel's company came up against the newly formed Ballet de Monte Carlo, René Blum's brand new company with Mikael Fokin as its ballet master and choreographer. Blum had initially wanted Balanchine for that role, but he had commitments elsewhere. It's my goal in life for everyone to realise that while these people might have been hugely talented, they were also massive divas. Both companies had popular seasons, with the Blum Company performing a more classical repertoire. Swan Lake, Giselle, and so on. Books were being written about ballet, exhibitions of costumes came, and they even had half-price school shows. In the 30s. <laughs> As the main company, the de Basel company, prepared for their US tour, a second company was put together to take the tour to Australia. 
Messine didn't like the idea that his ballets would be performed without him to directly supervise and, you know, dance a bunch of the lead roles. He actually sought an injunction from a judge. These guys are litigious, but relented when it looked like he wouldn't get a hearing before the company left. He instead demanded that he rehearse the ballets on the new dances. Like, dude, no one had a problem with you acting as a repeteur for your own ballets. Nobody. <laughs> Australia was a mixed bag. That's an understatement. Before the Ballet Bruce, we'd only gotten Anna Pavlova and her limited Fokin and Mordkin repertoire. The massive Balanchine, Fokin, Massine, Lucine, choreographering dude rap was extremely popular. The planned 16-week tour of Australia and New Zealand actually lasted 42 weeks. The downside is that Australia is hot and humid, and if you're used to dancing in a country with normal temperatures, the change can be pretty brutal. A lot of dancers fainted on stage, which, you know, gave opportunities for soloists to dance principal roles and the quarter ballet to dance soloist roles. What a cutthroat environment. The rest of the company went to the US for another successful season. New ballets this season included Symphony Fantastique by Messine and Le Pavilion by Lychin. Lychi. Lychi. <laughs> Choreographer David Lychi. That's not his name. Do we need another defection from the company? Is that... Oh yep, yeah, it's time for that. Messine wanted to form his own company. The Australia incident left him feeling like he needed more creative control. John Martin, who I mentioned earlier as the guy who wanted Massine to restart the Ballet Russe, started reporting on the possibility of a company based at the Met in New York run by Balanchine, Massine, and Lilfa. I can imagine them all collaborating happily. <laughs> the company did not happen, but Massine's solo company did. He took with him some dancers, including Tormanova and Danilova. Those two just jump ship at every opportunity. <laughs> De Basil hired Fokin as a replacement for Massine, who left at the end of his contract. Massine and De Basil went to court over who was going to have control over Massine's ballets, and they got split between the two companies for complicated contractual reasons. Not a lawyer. When I set about on this season, I didn't think that this much of my time would be spent talking about contracts. Blum was also making moves in his company, signing with Sol Hurok, which made him their American producer as well. The De Basel Covent Garden season was busier than usual. It was a coronation this year, and that meant an extended opera season, with more dancing, and two ballets being filmed for British TV. Falkin, being part of the De Basel team, meant that the old Falkin rep that was grandfathered in from the Diaghilev company was cleaned and restylized for this year's six-month US tour. The new ballets included a few works by David Lichin, Francesca de Rimini, Le Dieu Mediant, and Lion Amoureux, as well as Michael Falkin's Le Coq d'Or. The last of these included Sono Osato as one of the visions. You might remember her. Also in the US, you know, on Broadway, Rogers, Hart, and Balanchine collaborated on two shows, I Married an Angel and The Boys from Syracuse. The latter is based on Shakespeare's Comedy of Errors, and the former is going to be important next episode and in another later episode. Get came. Frederick Lowe of Lerner and Lowe, wrote music for Great Lady, whose ensemble included Jerome Robbins, Alyssa Alonso, and Nora Kay. The next year, 1939, saw Hammerstein and Kearns very warm for May, Stars in Your Eyes with Jerome Robbins and Nora Kay, The Straw Hat Review, again with Jerome Robbins, and Swing in the Dream, choreographed by Agnes DeMille. Eventually, Sol Hirok decided he only wanted to manage the new Blum Messine Company, not the De Basil Company. Rather, he wanted to buy the latter's sets, costumes, repertoire, and dancers' contracts, not de Basel's, and amalgamate it all into one company. It really looked like that was going to happen, and de Basel did step down for a time, but not for very long, and it just, it just didn't happen. These guys aren't good team players. They don't like working together. 
De Basil instead brought his company to Australia. <laughs> Ballyrus came to Sydney, my home city, they performed in the Royal Theatre. This particular venue has been out of commission from 2016 until December of last year, 2021. It opened with the Alanis Morissette show Jagged Little Pill. In only a few months, An American in Paris will open there. It's a show we're going to be talking about a little bit more in the latter half of the season, but they brought out the original principles both in the ballet and theatre sense of the word, Leanne Cope and Robbie Fairchild. The latter is a New York City ballet dancer, and what's more, the whole production is being produced in conjunction with the Australian Ballet, which was founded by a Ballet Russe member. I guess the weather and, like, lack of war or revolution made hanging out here seem like a good idea. This just makes me think we're not at the end of history, we're right in the middle of it, Their new repertoire this season included Prote, The Prodigal Son, and Graduation Ball by David Lychine, as well as Paganini and Cendrillion by Michel Fouquin. Cendrillion is just the French name for Cinderella. Sono Osato danced with the company in soloist roles. You might remember her from last season's Jerome Robbins and his peers. She'll be back, though. On Broadway, 1940 had Keep Off the Grass, with choreography by George Balanchine and Jerome Robbins in the ensemble. Louisiana Purchase by Irving Berlin, again choreographed by Balanchine. He also choreographed Cabin in the Sky. Rogers and Hart had another show this year, Pal Joey, starring Gene Kelly. Yes, singing in the rain, Gene Kelly. Also an American in Paris, Gene Kelly. The next year was pretty tumultuous. For the DeBasil Company and personally for Rene Blum, New York dance critic John Martin called out what people generally saw. The DeBasil Company was the superior one. They now had Nijinska as a ballet master. But on the American tour, everything started to fall apart. Wages were continually going down and down. Eventually, in Mexico City, everyone went on strike. And then Sol Hurok pulled his funding. With a homegrown alternative for ballet tours in the form of ballet theatre, it became less and less necessary for him to sponsor the Russian company. There was only one new piece of rep this season, George Balanchine's Balustrade. Another important thing happened in this tour. They performed in Oklahoma, and five-year-old Barbara Brochet was in the audience. You probably don't know that name. She would go on to be a brief, bright star at the New York City Ballet. Alexandra Danilova performed the night she attended, seeing her as the glove seller in Gate Parisienne and Zobidi in Scheherazade. What is this ballet theatre? If you listened last season, you might remember Fancy Free and Ballet Theatre from there. This year, they made their Broadway debut, performing Agnes de Mille's Three Virgins and a Devil. She was the priggish virgin and Robbins was the youth. Giselle, with Robbins as a peasant and Nora Kay as Giselle's friend and a willy, and Anthony Tudor's gala performance, with Robbins as attendant cavalier and Nora Kay as la reine de la danse. The title of this ballet really doesn't give it the credit it deserves as a comedic ballet. It's basically about three dancers from three countries all trying to upstage each other. I'm going to quote directly from this book, The Ballet Russe, to talk about what happened to René Blum. On December 12th, 1941, René Blum was interned at the concentration camp of Grolieu. Later, he was transferred to Drancy, where on September 23, 1942, he boarded a train with 80 other French intellectuals and was set on the road of deportation without return. The next couple of years were difficult for the Ballet Russe. They were shut off from Europe because of the war. They did their first ever tour to South America, which was a pretty good pretty good except for the part where they partnered with the Cologne Ballet. They shared a venue and repertoire and dancers but they had two directors. I swear this whole thing would have been so much easier for them if they just spent less time infighting. I know it's just an idea just saying just just saying. The only new piece of rep during this time 
January 1942 and August 1946, was Cain and Abel by David Lachin. While the ballet Russe was struggling, ballet and dance on Broadway had entered a kind of golden age. 1942 saw three shows choreographed by George Balanchine. The Lady Comes Across, Rosalinda, and The Fair at Sorinsk. 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 I'm still bad at Russian, guys. The next year saw the groundbreaking musical Oklahoma. I did a whole season on this, if you want to know more. It was choreographed by Agnes DeMille, who also did the musical staging for One Touch of Venus the same year. Balanchine had two more musicals this year, The Merry Widow and What's Up. And yes, I know The Merry Widow is an operetta, but I'm not getting into that here. 1944 saw the premiere of Fancy Free, as well as its adaptation to On the Town, choreographed by Jerome Robbins, with music by Leonard Bernstein and lyrics in a book by Camden and Green. The West Side Story season has some more info on that particular show. Agnes DeMille choreographed Bloomer Girl, and Balanchine had two shows, Dream with Music and Song of Norway. The next year, he choreographed Mr. Strauss Goes to Boston. Rodgers and Hammerstein had a follow-up to their world-changing musical with Carousel, also choreographed by Agnes DeMille. Jerome Robbins had a busy year directing Common Ground, choreographing Billion Dollar Baby, and bringing his own ballet into play to Broadway. Interplay is just one of those ballets that's so cool. I really like it. In the interim, Sol Hurok worked with the Ballet Theatre before falling out with that company and leaving it in the care of Oliver Smith and Lucia Chase. He still had a few years left on his lease with the Met Theatre, though, and bringing the DeBasil Company back over to the States to perform solved his problem. Alyssa Markova and Anton Dolin were the two main stars for this season. The season included the new ballet Camille by John Torres. There were a few more performances in Spain, for example, but the company had more and more defections, with the insecurity of a no longer stable company having to compete with new ballet companies which were being established with homes. De Basel was trying to put together more engagements for the company, but by the late 1940s, it had really fizzled out. But not so for ballet, generally. There were again huge years for Broadway dance and Broadway ballet. 1946 had a ballet theatre performance including Jerome Robbins' Interplay and Fancy Free, and it featured the dancer Nora Kay. In 1947, Balanchine choreographed The Chocolate Soldier, along with a double bill of ballet featuring The Telephone and The Medium, both of which I think are lost ballets. Agnes DeMille choreographed the revival of Bloomer Girl, along with Lerner and Lowe's Brigadoon and Rodgers and Hammerstein's Allegro. This was the last show she'd do with that particular pair. It was a lot less successful than its predecessors, and Rodgers put the blame for this pretty squarely on DeMille's shoulders. Jerome Robbins choreographed High Button Shoes, for which he would win a Tony Award. The next year, he choreographed and directed Look Ma, I'm Dancing, and Balanchine choreographed Where's Charlie? It might seem like Balanchine was doing an incredible amount of work during this time, and I just have to say, you haven't seen the half of it. Next episode, we're going to be looking at the company he formed in the US, the New York City Ballet, how it started, his life, all his wives. I should be able to get to all of them. Next week, we are either going to have an interview with Lauren Johnson, who is a certified balletomane and just someone with a really interesting story, or an interview with a secret person, depending on whether or not they get back to me on Instagram. <laughs> I've got to head off to rehearsals now, or if you're listening to this, my weekend of shows went great, probably. If you'd like to come see Much to Do About Nothing, there will be links in the description. I would love to see you there. All right. Until next time, keep dancing. <laughs>